In my humble opinion, Bloodborne is the greatest of all Soulsborne games. Don't get me wrong, I love them all, but hot dog, Bloodborne's delectable flavours of visceral horror and cosmic dread, combined with its brutally punishing, fast-paced combat, along with all its other finely tuned elements and aspects, made for one of the most memorable and engaging gameplay experiences of the last decade. It's a sick game. One particularly interesting inclusion to the Bloodborne experience, however, was the Chalice Dungeons, an entirely optional but expansive wealth of content existing separately to the main story levels and bosses. After nailing the blood-starved beast at the end of Old Yarlum, it drops the Thumeru Chalice, which, along with a modest offering of ritual materials, allows access into the first of many of the game's Chalice Dungeons, where hunters partake in communion. At their core, the Chalice Dungeons are very simple. You traverse through the labyrinthine floors, through monsters, traps and treasure, and then pull the lever, opening the way onto the floor boss, and then onto the next two, or in some cases, three floors to do the exact same so as to conquer the dungeon, gaining a wealth of blood echoes, blood gems, ritual materials and higher level chalices in the process, so as to delve ever deeper down into the more challenging and exotic dungeons. For this video though, it's the Chalice Dungeons bosses in particular that we're going to be talking about and ranking, because a very cool aspect of the dungeons is that along with them hosting an impressive array of all new enemies which don't appear anywhere in the base game, there are also a respectable selection of unique bosses of varying difficulty, mystery and deformity. Mind you, many of these bosses are simply creatures from the base game, except buffed the hell up so as to provide way more challenge, and trust me, things can get profoundly challenging in these here dungeons. As for what does or does not count as a boss as far as this video is concerned, well, it's simple. If it has a boss health bar, it's a boss, even if it's just some dumb pig. Furthermore, some of the bosses actually have different variants, with not only distinctive visual designs, but altered movesets too, and thus, I'll be considering each variant as its own boss to be ranked independently. And so, after doing the maths, algorithms and formulae, unless I have made some grievous error, I deem the final count to be a total of 23 bosses to be ranked, and of course, I'll be working my way from worst to best. If you enjoy the video, hey! why not subscribe to the channel? I make fun videos about great games. And lastly, please allow me to give a fond thank you to my kind patrons for their support for the channel. And with all that being said, let's kick off with boss number 23. Well, I mentioned that some Chalice Dungeon bosses are literally just regular enemies from the base game, but buffed up somewhat and given a big boss health bar. Health bar. And this is one of those enemies. The Brain Sucker is definitely one of the weirder creatures in the game, and one most first time players will likely be quite alarmed by when they first encounter it in places like Cathedral Ward, Bergenworth and in particular Upper Cathedral Ward, but they also appear as a floor boss, specifically within the particularly enigmatic East Chalice Dungeons. Brain suckers are very different in appearance and nature when compared to your more conventional beasts, sporting pale hairless skin in place of matted blood drenched fur, and instead of savage bites and clawed swipes, they send out paralysing projectiles before running in for the almighty suck, slurping up that sweet brain juice, draining you of a point of precious insight and dealing a fair wee bit of damage in the process. Despite my genuine efforts to hype these freaky creatures up though, the fact is that this is just a basic enemy. Not the most common enemy in the game, but hardly rare, particularly towards the end. Whilst they can be dangerous with their paralysis ability, both the AoE one and the projectiles, they're simple enough to fight and can be easily stun locked, and thrust damage in particular is massively effective. I was pretty damn hyped when I entered my first East Dungeon, because it can take a while before you actually have the prerequisite amount of ritual materials to actually enter into it, and unlike the other dungeon types, there's no easier dungeons at depths 1-4 to four to delve into to prepare. The Great East Chalice is depth 5, and so you expect something far more impressive than this suck boy, especially seeing as how these things are also to be found prowling around the regular floor of the dungeon. As such, I hereby declare the Brain Sucker to be the crappiest Chalice Dungeon boss. My feelings on the Man-Eater Boar are very similar to those of the Brain Sucker. 
Again, it's a basic base game enemy and one encountered very early on in the central Yarnum sewers, but in the early Thumeru dungeons these things appear quite a lot. In fact, I believe I encountered about 4 man-eater boar bosses on my journey deeper to the lower Thumeru depths, and any time I'd step through the door only to see yet another one of these oinkers, I would also oink, in disappointment. They are very basic to fight and are especially vulnerable to backstabs and then a follow-up critical, making their already low health pool feel even lower. Mind you, I don't think I've ever seen a regular man-eater boar from the base game do this poison breath attack. Maybe the regular ones do have this attack too, but I guess I tend to kill them before they even have a chance to do it. As basic and simple as the man-eater boar is, I do still enjoy fighting them, hence why I put it just ahead of the brain sucker, but it's that as a boss, it's pretty underwhelming, even if you do double or triple H HP and give it a bit of a damage buff. Though I noticed that they have a bit of a vocal debuff in the dungeons, because every time I fought them here, their opening shriek was totally muted for whatever reason. For me, the frequency of this boss and certain other enemies encountered throughout the Thumeru dungeons in particular actually do a fair bit to make early dungeon delving feel kinda tedious, which is a shame, because once you get into the Hinter Tomb, Loran and East dungeons, things do become a bit more interesting. Sticking with the Thumeru dungeons, at number 21 we have the Merciless Watchers. Unlike the previous two entries, these enemies are completely unique to the dungeons, appearing nowhere throughout the base game. That's not to say that they feel undercooked or tacked on though, because they are a solid enough enemy when encountered on their own throughout the dungeon, often situated in front of a lever, but when encountered as a boss they appear in groups of three, featuring two watchers and a chieftain. The watchers will tend to be the melee focused attackers, crowding down on you while the chieftain hangs back with regular shots from his pistol, and as such, smart spacing and separation of one enemy from the other tends to be a requirement here. There's really nothing all that extravagant about their moveset though, but rather, it feels exactly like what it is, a balanced group fight against three stronger Chalice Dungeon enemies. These encounters really aren't bad, but they are unremarkable, especially upon repeated encounters, because you will be fighting these dudes just as much as the man-eater boars throughout your early expeditions into the dungeons. There's actually another similar sort of enemy that appears far less frequently throughout the dungeons, though not as a boss, but I do have to at least mention the insane, naked, rolling fat dude who is armed with a massive morning star. This is one of the things I loved about the Chalice dungeons, just some of the really weird enemy designs that didn't quite fit into any of the base game levels, and so they just stuck him down here. Who thought of this dude? I love it. At number 20 we have the Loran Silver Beast, which is the first occurrence of a Loran dungeon boss so far. Now, despite me placing this boss so low in my ranking, let me say right off the bat that this is one of my favourite enemy designs in the whole game, and for this game, that is really saying something. It's like you took one of the more conventional beasts from Central Yarnum, but literally twisted it and made it 10 times more nightmarish and vicious. It can breathe fire from the torch it carries, it has a lightning AoE attack, its already sharp claws can extend out to several times their original length, and after enough damage has been dealt, it starts moving on all fours, becoming even more swift and deadly. The Loran Silver Beast is an awesome enemy, but it's also just a regular enemy from the base game with a boss health bar. First encountered in the Nightmare Frontier, but also appearing in the Nightmare of Mensis. In fact, the version you fight here is actually the nerfed version, because when fought in the Nightmare of Mensis, it explodes out in a shower of damaging worms, unless you kill it with fire that is, but here that doesn't happen. Now don't get me wrong, these worm things are one of my most hated enemies in Bloodborne, they're awful to fight, but even so, this is supposed to be a boss, and so they should have made a reappearance. Really cool enemy, but pretty underwhelming as a boss. Aha! Another unique Chalice Dungeon monster, how refreshing, except that monster happens to be the Undead Giant, specifically the variant with the chains on its back. There are in fact three different variants of the Undead Giant, each with different aspects to their appearance and with different moves, and in the case of the Cannon and Dual Blade variants, you can also encounter them as roaming mini bosses around the dungeons, which I think is really cool and kinda terrifying though as far as I know, the chain variant is restricted only to appearing as a floor boss, and thank god, because this enemy sucks. 
So, by the time I got to the chain variant, I was pretty cocky, having made mincemeat of the other two variants, but my cockiness came to an abrupt end upon being utterly nailed by its swinging chain attack. This chain attack is one of my most hated attacks in the whole game. I love how the undead giant looks, especially with the enormous sickle making up its left hand and then the disgusting flesh mallet making up its right, but that chain attack has deceptive range and deals insane damage, to the point where I was always afraid to even get close to it. Those really are my least favourite types of attack too, the ones that punish you for getting in there and wanting to deal damage, because it encourages a tendency to hang back, reducing the frequency of your attacks, thus extending the length of the fight, bringing the experience into the realm of frustrating tedium, and then you say, screw it, go in for the kill, and then get nailed by the chain attack again. I don't have the Undead Giant at number 19 solely because I find him really difficult, but because the difficulty of it feels downright off compared to most other encounters in the game and in the dungeons, and so this is not an encounter I particularly enjoy. I know a lot of people do not enjoy the ROM fight from the base game, encountered after a bold plunge into the Moonside Lake at the moaning encouragements of the good Professor Willem. But I've never hated ROM myself. It's not a great boss, and there are clear elements which make this encounter an annoying one, but even so I do enjoy a spectacle in my boss fights and I'm a sucker for a beautiful boss arena. Well, imagine you took away that bright, beautiful boss arena and placed ROM in a significantly more cramped one instead, and then gave it an additional 2000 or so HP and a big damage buff. Well, then you'd have the sort of boss that I'd place at around number 18 out of 23 in my ranking. This fight is brutally difficult. It's furiously challenging, it makes me so angry that I could just piss myself. Now, when she spawns a multitude of spiders, you must fight them there and then, because there's barely any space to actually run away from anything, and while just YOLOing it was a dangerous strategy that could work in the base game version, now that becomes a near impossibility, and even Rom's own wild thrashes and arcane attacks are made far more dangerous with the reduced capacity for manoeuvring. One of the worst things about ROM was always how tedious it felt to have to clear out each and every damn spider on every attempt before it was safe to go in and deal a bit of damage, only for her to go and spawn another 10 spiders each cycle, and so on and so forth, but it's even worse here, and it's still entirely possible to be literally one-shotted by one of those obnoxious dive bomb attacks from the smaller spiders. Pretty horrible encounter, but even so I can't quite bring myself to place it lower than number 18. Rom, consider yourself lucky to have even been placed this high, you dumb spider. For number 17 I have went with the Forgotten Madman, the only hunter type boss to appear in the dungeons, specifically shown up in the lower hinter tombs. Being a hunter enemy, there's really nothing unique about this boss's moveset, and in fact he just uses Ludwig's Holy Blade, which is constantly arcane buffed by the empty Phantasm Shell, and then he has a Holy Rifle in his offhand. The boss will throw out the occasional auger of Abritus though, and apparently he can also pull out a Call Beyond, which I thankfully missed on my encounter. Just like everyone's favourite gargoyle boss from Dark Souls 1, at half HP his accomplice joins the fray, sporting a Kark Hammer and Flame Sprayer, though wearing identical armour. As silly as it sounds to say, the madman set on display here really does bump up this boss's placement by a notch or two, because I love that they added a unique armour set here after beating it. It came as a big surprise to me too, because while I did spend a lot of time on the Chalice Dungeons many years ago, I couldn't remember these guys at all, and certainly not their uniquely weird armour, or the fact that it becomes available for purchase at the Insight Shop in the Hunter's Dream. As a battle, it's fine I guess, providing low to moderate challenge against a couple of outlandishly garbed hunters, though it would have been really cool if they'd had some unique attack to go along with their unique armour. I am on record as being an individual who enjoys the boss fight with the Celestial Emissary when they are originally fought in the Lumen Flower Garden in Upper Cathedral Ward. It's not very challenging, and it just puts you up against a load of regular enemies you've already seen, but even so, it's fun. It is fun to pop a beast blood pellet and start causing chaos amongst the flowers, and then absolutely lay into the main emissary once it balloons up in size. Well, the Celestial Emissary is back appearing in floor 2 of the Great East Chalice Dungeon, except it has no minions this time round and is already big by the time we get there, and thus it's more of a basic and honest fight compared to the more chaotic one from the base game. 
As such, the Celestial Emissary's moveset is laid bare for all to see, and turns out this isn't the greatest enemy to fight one on one. Regardless of how foolish it looks with its dumb, wobbly head, it definitely can destroy your health bar with its furious combos if given the chance, but even so it doesn't make for an especially interesting fight, even in phase 2 where the tentacles sprout from its head. It actually does have a cosmic projectile attack it can do in phase 2, but because there's no good reason to make any distance from the boss when fighting it one on one, you probably won't even see it. Still, it's a fun enough fight, but just not as fun as the original iteration, and certainly not among the best the Chalice Dungeons have to offer. So just like with the Merciless Watchers and Maneater Boar, the Keeper of the Old Lord is not a rare sight when traversing through the Thumeri Dungeons. At first, it's a real novelty seeing this enemy, but after your fourth or fifth time seeing it, just like with the others, it gets a bit old. Still, best to judge the boss based on its own merits alone. Straight away, this seems like an enemy from a different game, specifically the Souls games, sporting a similar hat to Yuria from Demon's Souls and Carla from Dark Souls 3, and to go even further, the Keeper straight up uses Pyromancy. In Phase 1, it'll use what looks like combustion, along with a dual fire wave attack, and then in Phase 2, it imbues its weapon with fire for extra damage and a rather bothersome fire after effect after each melee attack. For whatever reason, I had memories of the Keeper of the Old Lords as being a really easy boss that you can just run in and stunlock it to death, but no. I died a lot to this boss on my most recent expeditions, and that's because its fire had decent range and hurts a lot. I think the Keeper's size is deceptive, because it looks like it will be a pushover, but this really was one of the Chalice Dungeon bosses I died the most to. Also, like the Forgotten Madman, beating the Keeper unlocks the Bone Ash armor to purchase back in the Hunter's Dream, which again, is pretty sick. But unlike the Forgotten Madman, this is a completely new enemy with totally unique attacks, hence why it goes a couple of places ahead of the Forgotten Madman. Like the Undead Giant, you can even find these enemies roaming around in some dungeons, except those encounters can be even harder than the boss encounters, because they'll be accompanied by a pair of dog enemies. At number 14 I have the Undead Giant, again, but this time it's specifically the Twin Blade variant. I remember my very first time going through a Chalice Dungeon, years ago, not being quite sure what to expect, especially as far as the bosses were concerned, but then I entered through the boss door and saw the Undead Giant, this lumbering Frankenstein's monster of fused flesh and blades. God damn it, what an awesome enemy design, especially with the multitude of still lit candles placed on its back, and even the smaller details like the hood covering the upper part of its face, which is another detail that makes it differ from the other two variants who do not have hoods, though it still has that massive chin. Fighting the Twin Blade variant is pretty much as dangerous as it looks with its slow, heavy attack, though its seemingly sluggish speed can be deceptive when you take into account its ability to jump halfway across the room if you're being too coy in getting in there with the damage. It can also cover a surprising amount of ground with its attacks too, making the somewhat cramped arena feel even smaller. That said, there's no bullshit in this fight like there is with the chain variant of the Undead Giant, and as with all three variants, there is a blood filled sack placed on its body which can be popped open for a nice big chunk of damage to help with the giant's large health pool. Very solid enemy with a truly awesome design, and I was always happy when I walked through the boss door and saw one of these things at the other end. Unless it was the chain variant, which can fuck right off. And sticking with the Undead Giants one last time, at number 13 I have the Cannon variant. My thoughts on these dudes are pretty much the same as my thoughts on the last dude, except I've placed the Cannon variant just ahead of the Twin Blade variant because I can't get enough of this design of an enormous cannon crudely chained onto its left arm. It's so fucking cool. And on top of that, its right arm has been replaced with a Great Axe, which is also fucking cool. This variant seems to be less mobile than the Twin Blade Giant, but it makes sense when you consider that it's the only one that can fire projectiles. I mentioned that you'll sometimes see undead giants roaming around in actual dungeons, and indeed, most of the times I saw these things out in the actual levels, it was the cannon variants, like here when I saw one lurking down in the swamp below. Sick moment, sick enemy. Ibritus is a boss that I've always found to be just about top tier when it came to her design, not to mention how ominous and alien she looks as you approach her at the Altar of Despair, located directly beneath the Grand Cathedral. There are no recognisable features 
anywhere on her body other than perhaps her skin, which kind of resembles that of an elephant. But other than that, she is a confusing mess of tentacle, <laughs> of tentacles and macaroni tube things. As a result, however, I've never quite loved fighting her because the chaos of her design can make it difficult to interpret her attack animations, all those flailing tentacles and head bashes. And so, I tend to just tolerate this fight, because she doesn't have an insane amount of health, and the limbs can be staggered with focus strikes. Well, just like how my opinion of Rom went down a bit upon her appearance in the dungeons, the same is kind of true of Abritus, though to a lesser extent. The dungeon version of Abritus appears at the end of the Great East Chalice, which is a reward for beating the base game version, but she's much more challenging here, boasting nearly twice the amount of HP and of course a higher damage dealing capacity. Here, there was really no option to just fly in and start hitting her grotesque body with reckless abandon, because now she can tank pretty much anything you throw at her and then destroy you with one of those charge attacks with a horrendous hitbox for your trouble. I shall be honest, I summoned an NPC helper here in the form of Madman Waller, who as far as I can tell is the same hunter we fight in the forgotten Madman boss. Pretty cool. Of course, back when the game first came out, summoning this NPC was not an option because the old hunter's bell wasn't a thing yet. But it is a thing now and so I made use of it, because Abritus is just a tough tentacled pill for me to swallow I'm afraid, though I still consider her to be a decent enough boss. So, the Beast Possessed Soul is an example of an enemy that does actually appear in the base game but who is easily missable there, located at the bottom of the Cathedral Ward, below the place where you enter in the real Hunter's Workshop. Honestly, I loved this surprise encounter and was always disappointed that this is the one and only time it appeared in the base game, because its design is uniquely threatening. Most other hairy, wolf-type enemies encountered still have at least some trace of their former humanity remaining, but this thing looks entirely bestial, with not even a single scrap of clothing remaining, and it even has the ability to use a sort of pyromancy. And so, I was very glad when I ventured down into the Chalice Dungeons only to encounter the beast-possessed soul once again, but as a boss. Its moveset seems to be identical as far as I can tell, but its HP is far more beefed up, preventing the fight from ending too early giving you the chance to see all its cool pyromancies and that seemingly never-ending swipe combo. While the boss doesn't have a second phase, as such, it can go into a state of frenzy if you get nabbed by its charged grab attack. And as if the boss's visual design wasn't awesome enough, they went and gave it this animation of it chomping on your head, complete with a drawn-out after animation of it savouring the taste. To kick off the Chalice Dungeon's top 10, I have chosen Amygdala. Of course, the player encounters several lesser amygdalas throughout Yarnum and beyond, and then a greater amygdala at the end of the Nightmare Frontier after getting lured there by this prick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> that amygdala encounter really isn't so bad difficulty-wise. It's moderately difficult, especially in the second phase where it rips its arms off, sick, but depending on when you decide to go to the Nightmare Frontier, if you decide to go there at all, because it is optional, and also it's kind of a shit area, it's entirely possible to just smoke this boss with some well-placed blows to the head for some staggers and crits. Well, yet again we have an example of a base game boss that has been substantially buffed and it's encounters like this which make me realise that the only thing keeping many bosses that I consider to be reasonably challenging from being absolute powerhouses of difficulty is a larger health bar. And you know what makes that encounter even harder still? Well, why don't you take my health and then cut it in half, which is exactly what happens if you decide to take on the defiled chalice. Fuck. My. What a nightmare of an encounter. Thankfully, there is the option to summon an old hunter here, but again, this was not an option back before the DLC, and indeed, I did beat the defiled Amygdala solo many years ago, please believe me, along with a certain other defiled boss which is soon to be mentioned. It really is just the same old Amygdala at its core, but it feels different when you're fighting it under such frankly unreasonably difficult conditions. It's way more intense, and I think deserving of the number 10 spot. I'll be honest, I've got little to no idea of the general sentiment out there in regards to common perceptions of the Chalice Dungeon bosses. I don't know which of them most folk like, and which they don't, and that includes Yarnum Thumerian Queen, who to me has always been a bit underwhelming. 
Yarlum is the closest thing the Chalice Dungeons have to a final boss encounter, being located at the lowest depths of the Thumeru Dungeons, appearing at the end of Great Thumeru Ihil on the third and final floor. Now, Yarlum is kind of unique in that although she does appear in the base game, specifically after defeating Rom and before fighting Mergul's wet nurse, her inclusion is restricted to just being a wordless NPC you can barely interact with though she does have enormous significance to the story, being the tragic mother of the infant great one, Mergo. Of course, her name is also very significant, sharing it with the city of Yarnum, invoking some lost but deep connection between herself and the city, which would be built many hundreds if not thousands of years after her reign amongst the Thumerians. Due to her plot significance, and the fact that she's located so deep within the dungeons, you might expect an absolutely stellar boss fight comparable to the quality of the encounters with other soon-to-be-named Thumerians lurking in the dungeons, but what you get instead is a more than decent boss fight, perhaps a 6.5 or 7 out of 10 if I was giving scores, which I'm not, so pretend I didn't say that. There are three separate phases to this battle, but there are two common traits which persist throughout. One, she uses blood to deal damage, and lots of it, ranging from blood projectiles to blood AoE attacks to blood-based ground spikes, and two, if you stay near her for a bit too long, you will be paralysed as if hit by one of the brain sucker's projectiles, though the foe in this case is the unseen infant Mergo, whose cries signal the coming AoE attack. This aspect makes her pretty annoying to fight, because she already has a lot of health, and so only being able to unleash two or perhaps three attacks before having to back right off gets a bit frustrating. The phase changes do keep it from getting too stealth though, expanding her range of attacks, giving her some melee capabilities, particularly when she produces a blood sword, and on top of all that, she can also make clones of herself, though again, her tendency to do this quite frequently can make the fight drag somewhat. Even despite my grumblings regarding her moveset, I wouldn't quite say this is a boring boss, because it is still challenging and you can absolutely die if you get too careless, but I'm just not the biggest fan when it comes to the whole having to hang back thing. You do get a curious key item upon defeating Queen Yarnum, but sadly it doesn't actually do anything. It's like getting the Mark of Conquest after beating Nemesis in FF10, serving only as a token of victory. Yarnum is not the only being of the ancient Thumerian race, however, because here at number 8 we have the Thumerian Elder, one of two variants of this enemy type, with the other being the Thumerian Descendant. This particular variant sports the same slender form, pale skin, and white hair as Queen Yarnum, except the Elder is armed with a cane in his right hand, but in his left hand he has one of the most unique weapons in the game, appearing as a sort of flame spear that can also morph into a halberd, a mace, a sickle, a lance, and even more impressively, a flaming crossbow when at range. The Thumerian Elder doesn't quite have Yarnum's cloning ability, but he will frequently just straight up teleport to a different spot in the arena without warning, often creating a bit of distance between himself and yourself for a follow-up flaming crossbow bolt. Not that these are terribly difficult to avoid, though his running mace attack is a tad more problematic, more so because the camera likes to spaz out here, making it difficult to see exactly when the attack lands. The Thumerian Elder is a super interesting boss, and in fact one I only saw a single time in all my Chalice Dungeon exploring, which kinda makes him even more interesting to me, especially seeing as how much care was put into his design and animations. Pretty much the only thing that perhaps lets this boss down a bit is that surprisingly he's really not that challenging, or at least he doesn't feel quite as challenging as he should, especially when compared to the Thumerian Descendant who I will be discussing a bit later. The Watchdog of the Old Lords is one of those bosses powerful enough to evoke a mental groan from me upon its mere mention. Now, that groan isn't because I think it's a shitty boss, otherwise I would not have placed it here at number 7, but rather, it's because along with the aforementioned Amygdala, the Watchdog of the Old Lords is one of the enemies fought in the Defiled Chalice, which puts you at half HP, and it's rough. In fact, that particular encounter is the single most difficult challenge I've ever faced in this game, though again, it's been many years since I last beat him completely solo. This latest time when I fought him, I did again make use of an old hunter companion, because I've served my time with the defiled watchdog of the old lords. It took me over a hundred tries, and I'm never fucking doing that again. Of course, like several other bosses mentioned here, the Watchdog is quite a frequent encounter in the Thumeri dungeons, including several of the easier, non-defiled ones, though even there he's pretty damn hard. 
This really is a very well fleshed out boss with an impressive moveset, and again it's really impressive how many attacks and animations they put into this enemy who never appears in the base game, and things get really intense when his health starts to get low. Even at first, its bites and slashes can be really troublesome to avoid, not to mention the AoE attacks and a very Quellag-esque lava spew attack, but when he starts to get really pissed off in the later phase, the Keeper of the Old Wards thing happens again, where some attacks get an additional fire trail after effect, and it becomes a lot to manage. The Watchdog is a very challenging fight, and despite how much frustrated pain it has caused me, it's also a good fight, though at the same time it is a wee bit messy, and I certainly raised my eyebrow more than a few times at some of its hitboxes. The Loran Dark Beast is a bit of a weird one as far as its name goes, because despite being a complete clone of Dark Beast Parallel as far as I can tell, they gave it a different name. It makes sense when you think that maybe they just wanted to differentiate this Dark Beast from Parallel, who was of course a specific named entity, but that doesn't quite hold up when you see that they gave the Chalice versions of Rom and Abritus the exact same names as their story versions. Anyway, I'm not just here to talk about its name all day, let's talk about the boss. So, the Dark Beast Parallel fight from the base game can vary widely in difficulty depending on when you fight it. If you take it on early, it can be a real challenge, especially if you're using a predominantly thrust type weapon, but if you fight it later on after beating Rom, when you're likely to be much more levelled up and with better equipment, then Parallel can be nailed in under a minute. With the Loran Dark Beast however, I feel that there is far less possible variance to the level of challenge. This seems like a boss you either find hard, or really hard, or really really hard, and indeed, I've found this particular Dark Beast to be really really hard. This boss was electrifying. It was a shock to the system. You must thunderstand. He zapped me. Horrendous puns aside though, it turns out that if you just give Dark Beast Parallel a fuckload more health and damage potential, then he turns into one of the hardest bosses in the game, who'd have thunk? In particular though, it's those AoE attacks that exacerbate things. They've always been a nuisance, putting a stop to your efforts at staying under him and hacking away at his legs, but in the Parallel fight it's really not very difficult to stagger him, cancelling out any of his current animations, including the AoE attack, but the Loran Dark Beast is significantly harder to stagger, and its AoE attack does significantly more damage. Here's an example. See? This boss was electrifying, it was a shock to the system. You must thunderstand. He zapped me, straight up. Even though the correct thing to do here, when you see it charge up, is to run the fuck away, I would often just try and push my luck and go for the stagger, but most of the time, it just wouldn't work and I'd get fried, burnt to a crisp. And while yes, that's annoying doing that thing I'm not a fan of where I'm being punished for trying to do damage, it also made for a really challenging and intense boss encounter that I somehow enjoyed quite a lot. And now we're back to another unique chalice creature with the bloodletting beast at number 5. This is another boss where I can't help but be damn impressed that they put all the work into making this insanely savage, brutal enemy design, and then tucked it away down in the dungeons where a lot of people will never see it. The Bloodletting Beast is absolutely terrifying and disgusting with the way its entire back has been split open, looking all wet and fleshy. Eww. Its design is also very distinct from most other beasts, because as opposed to it resembling a werewolf or some such, its posture and proportions are far more akin to that of a particularly fucked up gorilla. To actually fight this boss though, well look, despite me having it as high as 5, I don't quite love its actual mechanics. The battles often devolve into something of a messy melee, as I run around its legs while trying to work out what attack the boss is actually doing. This is one of those enemies where locking on at close to moderate range is a liability, much like many encounters with larger beasts. The thing is though, even though I'm kinda shit at fighting it, I've just never struggled much with the bloodletting beast. I don't know, to me, despite how intimidating it looks, it's always just felt to be a bit underpowered, and so even though I spend a lot of time getting hit, I usually still come out on top compared to a fair few other Chalice Dungeon bosses who I struggle much more with. I died way more to the Keeper of the Old Wards than the Bloodletting Beast. Even so, I always get excited at the prospect of fighting it, to behold its horror and its massive attacks, because despite being enormous in size, this thing is really difficult to outrun, and some of its attacks seem to stretch nearly to the other side of the goddamn arena. So you just heard me gush. 
about the bloodletting beast's horrific, frankly disgusting visual design and what a spectacle it all is, but clearly FromSoft didn't quite consider its design to be disturbing enough because located in the second floor of the great Thumeru Ihil Chalice Dungeon, just before Queen Yarnum awaits the headless variant of the bloodletting beast, looking even more disgusting. Mechanically, it plays out much the same way except here it has a blood rain type ranged attack which is actually pretty easy to dodge. Mind you, with this being a depth 5 dungeon, this encounter is no pushover, having a hell of a lot more health than the regular variant and doing much more damage. But then again, FromSoft went, no no no, and they said, we must make the beast even more visually repulsive. They said, now a massive worm pops out from the gaping bloody neck wound complete with an all new worm jab attack and oh my god I absolutely love everything about this. The phase 2 transition of the guardian ape encounter in Sekiro is actually one of my all time favourite video game moments, doing a lot to elevate that boss into something truly great, but FromSoft did a very similar thing here except with way more blood and an even grosser worm. If I enjoyed this fight mechanically just a bit more, the Headless Bloodletting Beast would be a clear winner for the number 1 spot, but as it is, I'm content to leave it at number 4. I'm afraid I have to be a bit of a boring bastard for the number 3 spot because I'm choosing a boss ripped straight from the base game with the Blood Starved Beast. This creature has always been terrifying to me because compared to all other beasts fought thus far, it's so much more foul and noxious to the point where instead of blood splattering out each time you hit it, the arena is instead doused in sprays of some thick, ambiguous toxic gloop, even spilling out as it darts around the arena in desperation for its next fix of blood. There's a savage urgency in its lashes and lunges, moving from one sickening onslaught of desperate attacks to the next, and then in phase 2, you can get poisoned simply by staying too close to the beast after enough contact with its disgusting blood. Then there's the fact that it's also been partially skinned too, with its own dangling red skin acting as some sort of fucked up cape. It's so sick. There's the beasts and bosses that are somewhat conventional, coming in vaguely recognisable forms, and then there's your more pale weird things who are still unsettling to behold, but in a different sort of way. But then you have bosses like the Blood Starved Beast, or the aforementioned Headless Blood Lighting Beast, who come in a vaguely conventional beast form, but with an additional layer of visceral disgust to their designs. A major difference between these two bosses however is that I love the Blood Starved Beast mechanically too, and when fought in the Chalice Dungeon it's much more intense due to the higher HP and damage. Obviously if I was going to rate a boss like this or Rom or Amygdala on originality, they'd probably get a 1 out of 10 because it's just a boss from the base game with more health, but I'm not doing that. I'm rating them based on the quality of their specific encounters down in the dungeons, and I love this buffed up version of the BSB. In the number 2 spot I have the Thumerian Descendant, the second of the two Thumerian variants. The names of these two enemies is a wee bit odd to me, because you'd think the Elder would be the more difficult and advanced variant of the two, but I've always found the Descendant to be way harder. He's extremely fast, has very long combos and his ranged attack is far more difficult to avoid than the Elder's crossbow attack. Furthermore, there's a phase 2 where he splits his sickle weapon in two, giving him an all new, even more dangerous moveset. The Descendant is one of those bosses that I've never gotten competent at fighting because his moveset is just very tricky to deal with for me, though thankfully he can be staggered with well timed gunshots, otherwise I'd probably still be fighting him to this day. Yes, the Chalice Dungeons have many larger and more monstrous enemy designs with big savage attacks, but this is just a very honest fight against an interesting enemy with a really cool weapon and moveset. In fact, this is the kind of fight that I would have liked to experience when going up against Queen Yarnum, rather than the comparatively more awkward, drawn out affair that we got. However, there is one more Chalice Dungeon boss that has not yet been covered because it's the one I think is worthy of the number one spot. And the trophy goes to the Abhorrent Beast. While this ferocious thunderous foe does lurk in some higher difficulty Chalice Dungeons, it is of course also present in the base game, though not as a boss, but rather as the true form of an easily missable NPC. I say easily missable, because I did miss the suspicious beggar on my first two playthroughs of the game, but then when I did come across him I thought, hmm, this guy's pretty suspicious, and so I attacked, 
only for him to transform into a particularly intimidating beast not found anywhere else in Yharnam, and one with the ability to speak no less. It's an incredible encounter that you never see coming, and even after you manage to put the beast down, it leaves you thinking, I can't believe that just happened. The thing is though, I've never really gotten much of a feel for the enemy's actual moveset in these encounters, but rather, I'm just focusing on taking it down as quickly as possible, because I'm terrified. And I've even been known to try and cheese it by standing in a nearby doorway, which it can't pass through. But, when I encountered the abhorrent beast in the Chalice Dungeons, that's when I absolutely had to contend with its true moveset and learn it properly, because it had way more health here and did much more damage, and that's when I realised that I fucking love this boss. The abhorrent beast is difficult right from the start with its powerful punches and 3 hit combos and its fairly short range air blast type attack, but even at the start you see slivers and flashes of lightning course through its dense fur. Then, after taking off around 25% of its health, the lightning intensifies and so does the boss's attacks, gaining range and in some cases an additional bolt after effect, and variations on its existing combos. Take off another 25% though, and now phase 3 begins, bringing the lightning effect up to maximum intensity and changing up certain combos yet again, and with a new leaping AoE attack. One of the things I love about this encounter is that due to its relatively small size when compared to other beast bosses, you get the best of both worlds, with it having a range of conventional punches and combos, but then also having more bestial blasts and slams. In fact, it's kind of like fighting a more complex version of the Gascoigne beast, and honestly, I just loved learning this boss's moveset. I found it very challenging, but equally satisfying, and thus, it made for my number one favourite encounter in all the Chalice Dungeons, so much so that even now I'm in the mood for another round. Well, there you have it folks, there is my list. The Chalice Dungeons are actually one of the areas of Bloodborne that I wasn't terribly well versed in compared to all its other content. I first explored them many years ago upon first playing the game, but then didn't touch them again until I put together my Bloodborne retrospective a few months ago, and this video, and so it had actually been a damn while since I'd fought bosses like the Bloodletting Beast and Watchdog of the Old Lords, however it was a hell of a lot of fun, and more Bloodborne is never a bad thing. And on that note, please allow me to give a final fond thank you to my kind patrons for supporting the channel. Cheers for watching, and cheerio.